Thank you for joining me for worship today. Today is the last Sunday of the church year, the last Sunday of End Times Christ the King Sunday. Our order of service is the service of the word which begins on page 38. We're going to open right now with hymn number 341, Crown Him with Many Crowns. of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins by the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are they who take refuge in him. Your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. Christ the King Sunday is from Ezekiel chapter 34 
verses 11 to 16 and 23 to 24. In this section, the Lord is speaking and he tells the people of a coming shepherd king, how in Israel, the, the shepherds, the spiritual leaders and the kings, they didn't take good care of God's people, but in this shepherd king, Jesus, there God's people would get perfect care. For this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock, when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines and in all the settlements in the land. I will tend them in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will, there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Alleluia. Our Lord said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, Alleluia. chapter 15, verses 20 to 28. From Paul's resurrection chapter, here it's talking about the first Adam, as in Adam and Eve, and the second Adam, Christ, and how the second Adam, how he takes care of our problems and, and how he rules over all things. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has to be put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who puts everything under him, so that God may be all in all. We'll sing our next hymn, hymn number 217, The Head That Once Was Crowned. Royal diadem adorns 
27 verses 27 to 44, where Matthew was inspired to write, Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Let's bow our heads for prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, who art our strength and our salvation. Amen. My dear fellow subjects of Christ the King, today, as I had mentioned, is the last Sunday of the church year, the last Sunday of end times, it's Christ the King Sunday. And it may be a little bit surprising at this time of year to be using a Good Friday reading as the, as the basis of the message for our sermon today. It may be surprising, but yet it really is appropriate because in this portion of scripture, 
All those aspects of being a king are really brought out with Jesus, our Savior, with Christ, our King. You have the crown of thorns. You have the scepter or staff that was in his hands. You have the purple robe and you have the obeisance, the bowing down of those soldiers in front of Jesus. And, well, they were mocking him when they were doing that, of course. But you have all of those aspects of being a king that are mentioned in this reading. And our text, what it does is it tells us of that climactic event in God saving activity in rescuing the human race from the consequences of sin. And there are two important facts for us to note here as we look at this. One is the willingness, the complete willingness of our Savior to endure everything that he did, to go through all of this. You know, he could have called down, he said earlier, he could have called down legions of angels to prevent his arrest. And he willingly, when he was arrested, he even identified himself and basically said, I'm the guy you're looking for. He identified himself and, well, in the Garden of Gethsemane, remember he had prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. See, he was totally willing to do what needed to be done. And the other thing that we need to note here is that God had been planning all of this and he had been revealing details about Jesus' death and its impact for a long time, ever since the fall into sin. See, it wasn't an accident. It wasn't the Jews who got Jesus to the cross. It wasn't Jesus' enemies who got him to the cross. It was God's plan. And everything happened as God wanted it to. Jesus suffered and died and endured all that he did for you and for me. Therefore, the charges that Pilate had posted on Jesus' cross, they couldn't be more accurate. Pilate had written, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And from our reading, we'll see that that was the mocker's taunt. That was the scripture's prophecy. And that, by God's grace, is our confession. By the grace of God, we're able to say, yes, this Jesus who was crucified he is my king. He is my savior. He is my way to eternal life. Just prior to our reading, Jesus had been in Pontius Pilate's courtroom on trial before Pilate. And Pilate, well, we know that he knew Jesus was totally in innocent and and. He really wanted to, he desperately wanted to try to do everything he could to try to get Jesus released. He didn't want the blood of an innocent man on his hands. Well, he knew Jesus was innocent. He wanted to release him, and so he had Jesus severely beaten to try to play on the mob's sympathy to get them to say, Oh, don't have him crucified. But the Jewish leaders in the mob, they wouldn't relent. So Pilate, because he was afraid of the Jews, he, well, remember he tried to wash his hands of the whole event. He washed his hands and said, okay, you crucify him. Our reading says, then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. A very sizable group of soldiers and doesn't reveal a number here, but that would have been the whole company. That would have been between like 600 and 1,000 soldiers 
All of these soldiers around Jesus, they were all mocking him. And they tried to, they tried their hardest to try to make Jesus look ridiculous by dressing him up as a king while putting that crown of thorns on his head, putting a purple robe on him and the staff or scepter in his hand. And got to remember about those soldiers, they had this natural, sadistic way about them in which they were trying to totally demoralize Jesus, to crush his spirits as they said, Hail, King of the Jews. Matthew tells us they spit on him and took his staff and struck him on the head again and again. They tried to demoralize him and and well he was suffering as he was enduring all of that but they couldn't really demoralize Jesus because Jesus really is the king he really is the king all too often though like those soldiers we can be guilty of trying to demoralize our savior even though we may not realize it but whenever we would deliberately sin against God, then what we're doing actually is we're mocking Jesus, we're spitting in his face. However, like those soldiers, they couldn't crush Jesus' spirit. Well, we can cause Jesus suffering, but we can never crush our Savior's spirit. He still is the great king who fought against Satan's sin, death, and hell, and paid for our sins and even for the sins of those soldiers who mocked him. But the soldiers, they weren't the only ones who mocked Jesus as the king of the Jews. There were those people who were passing by the cross who hurled their insults at Jesus and they said, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. As they insulted Jesus, they even quoted Jesus. But John tells us the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scriptures and the words Jesus had spoken. The mockers at Calvary, however, they didn't realize the real truth of what they were saying that day. Some of those mockers that day may even have been included in the crowds of people hardly a week before that the crowd of people that had honored and hailed Jesus, well, just five days before that on Palm Sunday when he royally entered into Jerusalem in, on Palm Sunday. Unfortunately, though, you know, they were praising him, but we can be kind of like those mockers. If, for example, after we have worshiped our God, we can go on to live our lives in such a way during the course of the week or other days that our acquaintances might ever question us and our Christianity. The Jewish leaders, they even lowered themselves to join the crowd as mockers against Jesus. They spoke of Jesus saving others and undoubtedly they were thinking about some of Jesus' healing miracles. Now they mistook Jesus' restraint here for weakness, the fact that he wouldn't come down from the cross. They pictured that as showing, well, see, you're not so great and strong and powerful anyway. But of course, we know Jesus did have the power to come down from the cross, but he wanted to be there because he knew that that was the only way for him to pay for the sins of the world. In one very real sense, Jesus could not come down from the cross if he wanted the sins of the world to be paid for. So 
Jesus continued to endure such terrible abuse. Then even what happened is that the robbers who were crucified with Jesus, they joined in insulting Jesus as well. So we see Jesus there at the depth of his humiliation. He was suffering a terrible, degrading execution. His friends had abandoned him. His enemies were insulting him. The robbers even were insulting him. But the greatest part of his humiliation was, of course, the fact that he was being forsaken by God, by his own heavenly father, his own father who dearly loved him, who was completely pleased with everything that he did. But he was forsaken by God so that he thereby endured real hell to pay for my sins and your sins and the sins of the whole world. All of this and more Jesus endured, suffered in our behalf so that you and I could be with him in heaven forever. Jesus endured all of that because the scriptures prophesied that he would be abused as a mock king. In the Old Testament book of Isaiah, Jesus had said, I offered my back to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Just think of how those soldiers abused the king of the Jews. Through King David in Psalm 22, Jesus had said, All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. This prophesies how those passing the cross and how those Jewish leaders would taunt Jesus. But why did all of that have to happen? Well, Jesus said, everything must be fulfilled. It's written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. But why did everything have to be fulfilled? Well, for one thing, if God is to be God, he has to be completely faithful to his word. And not if God is to be God, but since God is God, he has to be completely faithful to his word. If even one of God's prophecies had not been fulfilled, if one of his promises wasn't fulfilled, God would be imperfect like us. And he wouldn't be able to save us from our sins. But, but another reason why everything would, needed to be fulfilled as it was is so that the scriptures can work to call us to faith and strengthen us in our faith. As we search and study the scriptures, we can see how all of it fits together, how the scriptures cannot be broken, as the Apostle Paul says. And now as we see that the scriptures cannot be broken, that they all fit together, our faith is strengthened to know that we can depend on God and on absolutely all of his promises. Furthermore, the unity and the faithfulness of the scriptures has torn down the walls of unbelief in many people's hearts. There are plenty of documented cases of people who purposely went into reading the Bible to try to prove it, to have holes, to be a phony, to be fake. But the message of God's word in numerous cases worked on those skeptics' hearts to change them into believing children of God. That's why the scriptures needed to be fulfilled. Actually, when you think about it, their hearts were changed. They were trying to prove God wrong, but isn't that exactly what actually happens with us as well, with each of us? Before we were called to faith, the Bible was complete nonsense, stupid nonsense to us. Some of us 
maybe many of us were blessed because we had Christian parents who had us baptized into God's believing family. The Holy Spirit worked through that baptism to make us children of God when we were just infants, when we were very, very young. And because of that, maybe we don't remember a time when we would think of the scriptures as being stupid nonsense like that. But before we were called to faith, well, that's what it was. We couldn't appreciate its message. The Apostle Paul said, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Paul also said, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. See, it's only because of God's grace that we aren't like, well, the soldiers who mocked and abused Jesus, like those who passed by the cross who also mocked Jesus, like the robbers who sided with all of those mockers or, or like the Jewish religious leaders who, who wanted to have Jesus crucified. By God's grace, we aren't ashamed to call Jesus our Savior and our King, a King who was crucified who endured the most shameful, most horrible, excruciating execution that the world knew of, really, at that point in time. The most excruciating kind that was allowed by Roman law. But instead, by God's grace, what you and I are able to do, we're able to picture our bloodied Savior hanging there on the cross, drained of his physical strength, being also forsaken by God, enduring the full punishment of hell for us. We're able to see Jesus enduring all of that and still confess, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. This Jesus is the King of the true Jews, that is, all who by God's grace believe in him, he is my Savior and my King, and He's your Savior and your King. It probably was pretty easy for the crowd on Palm Sunday to think of Jesus as His King, as, as their King, as they saw Him riding in on the donkey with the palm branches waving, the garments strewn in front of him, all of the people shouting, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It was probably easy for them to say, yeah, that's our king. But how blessed we are that by God's grace through faith, we can think of Jesus hanging there on the cross and apparently defeated Christ on the cross and know that he would rise from the dead as our victorious king and as our way to eternal life. Yeah, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews, crucified, risen, and ruling. Now, in our hearts through faith forever, in heaven. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, by your victory, you have broken the power of the evil one. Fill our hearts with joy and peace as we look with hope to that day when every creature in heaven and earth will acclaim you King of kings and Lord of lords to your unending praise and glory. We pray to you, O Christ, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. in our prayers, Lord God, you called to his eternal home the soul of our brother, Stan Krozik. We're so thankful for the grace and mercy you gave to him during his earthly sojourn, during his time of grace. And now we ask you to please comfort all of his loved ones with the hope of a blessed reunion in heaven, which is, of course, only through faith in Jesus, our Savior. And Lord God, please be with all of the people on our prayer list, all those who are suffering from different aches and pains or trials and troubles, Lord God, be with them, give them your help and strength and help them always to remember, help all of us to always remember how we have you as our King. You as our King who's always watching over us, always with us, always making all things work together for our eternal good. Lord God, please keep, dear Jesus, please keep on looking out for us and for our eternal souls. And we gather together all of the prayers we have right now as we join in praying. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Let's join in singing our prayer for our country. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. Again, I'd say thank you for joining me for worship today. Just a couple announcements. Well, this Wednesday we have our normal Wednesday worship, which will be a repeat of the Sunday service, but a week from Wednesday is the first Wednesday in Advent, and our plan right now is to have our Wednesday Advent services on the 6th, 13th, and 20th, 6.30 service, soup supper at 5.30 before that. In the congregation, oh, you know, fail to remember that um, Lila's birthday was this past Saturday, a week ago. And uh, 
Well, I've told you about the different, or I've just mentioned our prayer list. Please look at that. If you need a copy of the bulletin sent to you, if you're seeing this online, please let me know. I can't send that when I text people with it, but I can send it via email to you if you're interested in it. Again, thank you for joining me for worship. Today was the last Sunday of the church year, kind of New Year's Eve. Next Sunday, the first Sunday in Advent, is New Year's Day as far as the church year is concerned. Again, thank you for joining me. The Lord bless and keep you always. Amen.